Okay, uh, good morning everybody and thank you so much for attending the Lighthouse Prep 20-minute GMAT drill. My name is Jinthan Sutaria and I'm going to be the presenter today as we talk about triangle properties. If you haven't been to a 20-minute GMAT drill before, uh, I'm going to give you a quick high-level overview of how this works. Uh, basically, we start off by covering one concept and spend about five minutes covering that concept. So for example, today we're going to talk about triangle properties and defining some of the different types of triangles. And then we spend the rest of our time doing some practice questions. So there are three practice questions for today's 20-minute GMAT drill, which you should have received via email before the webinar started. And if not, then um, you can uh, follow along anyway, because we're going to go through them in a lot of detail. So you should be able to keep up with it. And then afterwards, uh, if we have extra time or if anybody wants to stick around longer than the 20-minute drill, then we can do some Q&A. You can feel free to ask any GMAT-related question. I'll be happy to help in the best way possible. Okay, so let's get started with a quick introduction to the 20-minute drill. Basically, the 20-minute the drill was designed to give you a taster of what the particular concept we cover is, right? It's not meant to be an in-depth kind of lesson. So what I highly recommend is if you're attending one of these, what you should do is follow it up with doing some more practice problems and reading into it and doing some self-study on your own. The reason is because five minutes covering a concept won't give you all the different insights and doing just three practice problems isn't really sufficient to completely grasp a concept. Okay, so the key takeaway there is after the 20 minute drill, try to spend another 20, 30, maybe an hour um, to review some of these problems again and do some additional practice problems. Now, one thing I will add is that Lighthouse Prep, if you go to our website, www.lighthouseprep.us, there's a cool tool there called Polaris, and Polaris is a study companion for the official guide. And using Polaris, you can actually filter problems in the official guide by a certain question type. So for example, today we're covering triangle properties. You can actually go in there and filter by question type to get all the triangle related questions or all the geometry related questions in the official guide. So you can really go deep down into the particular concept we cover. Okay, so let's get started with our lesson. Today we're going to be covering triangle properties like I've mentioned. And so we're gonna start off by defining all the different types of triangles there are in, um, in geometry. So let's start off with the scaling triangle. And the scaling triangle is one that's defined by its sides. And what it means is that the three sides are all different. So what that would mean in this drawing here, for example, is that side CA is different from side AB, which is different from side BC, right? So this could be one, this could be two, and this could be three, for example. The second triangle that we're gonna cover is where two of the sides are the same. So again, looking at our example, this side and this side could be the same, and that would create an isosceles triangle. And these are just names we give triangles because it helps us identify different properties associated with the triangle. Okay, so we've covered all three sides being different. We've covered two sides being different. Now let's look at an equilateral triangle. An equilateral triangle is one where all three sides are the same. So in this example, you could have a side length of three feet here, three feet there, and three feet there. And that would mean that all three sides are exactly the same. And you can use these little tick marks to indicate that they're the same, okay? The other special property of an equilateral triangle is that all the interior angles are also the same in an equilateral triangle. So just because the sides are all the same, the angles also end up being the same, okay? Now we're gonna move on to a different type of triangle. Uh, if you notice in the first three, the three triangles were defined by their side lengths. Well, the next four that we cover are going to be defined by their interior angles and their interior angles will determine some special properties associated with that triangle. So we're gonna start with the right triangle, and a right triangle is simply one that has a 90 degree angle in it. 
So here you can see there's a 90 degree angle. And if you see a diagram like this on the GMAT that has a little square built into the edge of the triangle, that indicates that it's a 90 degree angle right there, right? So a right triangle has a 90 degree angle on the inside. That doesn't necessarily mean that these two angles over here are identical. So here we have 45 and 45. This could be a 30 and this could be a 60 or it could be any combination that adds up to 90 because remember all the interior angles of a triangle have to equal 180 degrees. Okay, so we've covered the right triangle. Now we're gonna move on to equal angular triangles. Equal angular triangles are just like the equilateral triangle. The only difference is they're defined by their angle instead of their sides. So same properties, uh, all the sides are still gonna be the same, but an equal angular triangle is defined by its angles right here, not by its side lengths, okay? but still all the properties end up being the same. An obtuse triangle. An obtuse triangle is one where you have one angle in the triangle that is greater than 90 degrees. So you can see highlighted here in red, right? It's over 90 degrees, therefore it's an obtuse triangle. But that also necessarily means that the remaining two angles are less than 90 degrees. Okay, now we're gonna go on to the acute triangle. Acute triangles have all three angles which are less than 90 degrees. So you have one angle here, one angle here, and one angle here. And all three of them, not just two of them, all three of them need to be less than 90 degrees. Less than 90 degrees, okay. So we've covered all seven types of triangles here and they all come with special properties. There's a great section in the official guide that'll also give you some additional information about this, but those are the seven types of triangles that you really need to know about. Now let's get into some other terms that you need to know to be able to understand some of the GMAT problems. Okay, so the first point is midpoint. And a midpoint is basically the point that lies between two points on any line segment. So here you have line segment PQ and M is the midpoint. So that would mean that PM right here is equal to MQ, okay? And the way you would see this on a GMAT problem isn't to say what is the midpoint, but it would have, let's say this would be a triangle, and they would say there is a certain point M that is the midpoint of PQ, is PM identical to MQ? And you'd have to solve it that way, right? So midpoint is basically just the exact middle of two different points. Okay, bisect. So a bisect is a term that's related to angle measurement. And so if you had an angle like this one here, let's say this angle is 126 degrees, right? Well, 126 degree angle being bisected simply means that there's a line running through it that cuts the angle in half, right? So you end up with 63 on one side of the angle of the new segment and 63 on the other side. It, all it did was it divided the angle in half, okay? Perimeter. A perimeter is basically just the border of the triangle here. So in this in instance, for example, it would be here and here and here. Right, all three of these sides added together would equal the perimeter. So just looking at our example, it would be 17 plus 30 plus 28. And that would give you, let's see, it gives you 25, uh, 45, and 75 is your total there. So the perimeter of this triangle would be called 75. Okay. And then the area is the inside of the triangle, the area that goes inside the triangle. So it would be all of this right here that's in the yellow grid area, right? And the formula for an area is area equals base times height divided by two. Base would be the leg of the triangle right here, right? Um, the height would be, it wouldn't be one of the legs, it would be going perpendicular, meaning at a 90 degree angle from the base, to the very top of the triangle right here. So in this instance, it's eight units. So if we wanted to solve this out, it would basically be area equals base, which is 15, times height, which is eight, divided by two. And that gives you 60 is your area. And area is usually expressed in some kind of unit squared. So it would be eight, 60 meters squared or 60. Um, okay. Now we're going to uh, go over some practice questions. So um, you've gotten to go over some of the properties of the triangles. Now we're gonna look at some practice questions. So practice questions, 
starting with the first one. If n is a positive integer less than 15, for how many different values of n is there a triangle with sides of lengths 9, 3, and k? Okay, so let's start off by defining what is n. So it says n is a positive integer, so you know n is greater than 0. And then it says it's an integer less than 15, so you know it has to be less than 15. So the question is, for how many different values of n is there a triangle with sides of lengths 9, 3, and k? Okay, so the question is really, uh, what is k, how many different values of k can there be? So we're going to do, you're going to have a line segment here, which is 3, and you're going to have a line segment here, which is 9. And you want to know how many possible values of k can there be for it to make a triangle. Well, so one thing you need to know about triangles is that all three points of the triangle must touch each other, right? And therefore, even if you put these in a completely straight line, the greatest value that you could have for the third line segment has to be less than 12. Otherwise, the points wouldn't touch each other. So the answer here would start off with k has to be less than 12, okay? The other part is if you were to rotate this all the way around, and flip it so it would be starting here to here is 3, then it has to be greater than 6 here. Otherwise, the lines would overlap. So therefore, k has to be greater than 6. Okay, so now you end up with k has to be greater than 6 and less than 12. So really all you have to do is count how many integers fit that criteria. So the criteria would be 6 and 12, so you'd have 7, you'd have 8, 9, 10, and 11. And therefore, you get five different integers, and the correct answer here is C. Okay, on to question number two. Question number two says, a 60-foot high perfectly straight tree breaks partially at its midpoint and falls against a building. The tree is now angled at 120 degrees at the breaking point. If the floors of the building are 12 feet high, which floor did the tree impact? Okay, so we're going to start off with the, breaking down the question a little bit. So we have a tree that's 60 feet high. So here's my 60 feet high tree. That's 60. Okay. Breaks at its midpoint. So if this is one point and the ground is the second point, then let's say this is the midpoint and falls against a building. So I'm going to make it fall against a building like this. Here's my building and it's got some windows on it. And Okay, all right, falls against the building at 120 degrees. So this right here is 120, okay? If the floors of the building are 12 feet high, which floor did the tree impact? So basically what they're asking is, okay, so this is the midpoint. You know this line segment here is 30 and this is 30, but it fell over, so this is actually what's 30, right? You don't know how far the tree was away from the building, and you don't know how high this point ends up being yet, right? But what you do know is if you draw a line parallel to the ground, you get a right angle here. And therefore, because the total angle here was 120, this interior angle is going to be 30 degrees, okay? So you get 30 degrees on the inside angle here. You don't know what yet what this angle here is. And because this is a line parallel to the ground, and we're going to assume that the building is completely vertical, this is a 90 degree angle, okay? Well, because the interior angles of a triangle have to total to 180 degrees, basically you can start with 180, subtract the 90, subtract the 30, and you know that this is 60 degrees right here. Okay, so now I have a 30, 60, 90 degree triangle, and that comes with some special properties. The special properties include being able to figure out the sides of the triangle. So here's how you do that, okay? So if I have a 30, 60, 90 degree triangle, let's say this is 90, this is 60, and this is 30, then the properties of the triangle say that if this is one, then this is two, and this is square root of three, okay? Well, so in our case here, we want to solve for x here to see how much higher than 30 feet the tree landed. And we know that this is 30, so the ratio between here and x, so between 30 and x, has to be 2 to 1. So we know that x must equal 15. Okay, so the total height of the impact of the tree right here is 15 plus the 30 
where the base snapped away from it. So it's 45 feet high, okay? Now, if you're 45 feet off the ground, the question next is, which floor did you hit, right? So the floor that you hit, you can basically say, okay, 45 divided by 12 gives you, gives you four, and so therefore you hit the fourth floor, okay? So, and I rounded, by the way, it's 48 divided by four equals 12, but uh, sorry, 44, 48 divided by 12 equals four, but you can round to get inside of that floor. So you get the fourth floor. So the key takeaway here is on the GMAT, you're gonna see some problems that look like complex word problems, but more often than not, if you start to diagram it on your little whiteboard, then you can typically figure out there's some kind of special triangle properties or some kind of geometry or some kind of diagram which will help you solve the problem. The, the trick here is to draw everything out so that you can make clear sense of what the question is asking you. Okay, let's go on to question number three. Okay, question number three says, country X's military base is located southeast of the country's capital. Traveling at 200 miles per hour in a helicopter, soldiers from the military base can reach the border post in three hours. If all roads in the country are perfectly perpendicular and run north-south or east-west, how long would it take soldiers to reach the capital by tanks which travel at 40 miles per hour? And then we look at our answer choices and they're all expressed in some kind of square root form. So let's start diagramming this out to make it easier, okay? Country X's military base is located southeast. So I'm going to put a dot here for the military base of the country's capital. So let's say the capital is over here, All right? So I've got my military base that's southeast of the capital, okay? And then there's a helicopter flying from the military base to the capital, and it goes 200 miles per hour for three hours. So that would equal 600 miles, right? If you didn't get how I did that, basically, it's 200 miles per hour times three hours, and that's what gives you 600, okay? Now, all the roads in the country run perpendicular. So you have one here and one here, okay? And perpendicular, if you didn't catch that, it just means that the two intersecting lines form a 90 degree triangle. So, or, sorry, a 90 degree angle. And so you have a 90 degree angle here and the tanks are gonna go across this way and then up again, right? And now you're faced with an isosceles triangle also because you can see that how it's, this leg would be the same as this leg, right? So that would mean that this angle right here is 45 and this angle right here is 45 so that all the interior angles of our triangle can total up to 180. And then you have to figure out what's the side lengths here so you can see how long it would take a tank to get there. Well, going back to our special triangles, our special triangle property says that the ratio of the sides between uh, the sides of a 45, 45, 90 degree triangle. So if this is my 45, 45, 90 degree triangle, this would equal one, this would equal one, and this would equal square root of two, okay? So here, what we can do is we can say, if the ratio between the side and the hypotenuse, which is this long leg right here, has to be one to square root of two, then in this case, it's gonna be 600 over square root of two equals this side right here and 600 over square root of two, whoops, I did that wrong, 600 square root of two, and 600 over square root of two here, okay? So now we just need to figure out what's the distance here combined, and so that's going to be equal to 600 square root over square root of two, plus 600 over square root of two. And so I'm gonna multiply that by two to get both of these distances, and that gives me 1200 over square root of two, okay? And now I need to figure out how long, because remember my answer is expressed in terms of hours, so I need to figure out how long it'll take the tanks to get there. And so if they're traveling at 40 miles per hour, what I need to do is divide by 40. And so what I end up getting is 1200 divided by 40, which equals 30, over square root of two, which is an answer choice. I have answer choice E right here, and that is the correct answer. Okay, so now we've solved the three practice problems that are included in this 20 minute drill, but there is a bonus question. And if you haven't already, check out our Facebook page. We've posted the bonus question. We typically do it before the webinar starts. 
and there's a great video explanation going through it. The bonus question is a little bit more difficult and it's a data sufficiency type problem. So please check us out on Facebook. Our Facebook page is Lighthouse Prep US. And with that, I will open it up to any questions if you have any.